Boy, he's coming. He's coming, breathing fire, Kane. Oh. He's not happy with you. You've been potting champion data on Channel Nine. Oh, and he wants to write a reply. Not, that is not true. Horny and I have had these Jeez. discussions before. There's a bit of mayo there, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> We've had these discussions oh. before, Horny, and you're referring to the kicking stat, which Horny and I have discussed. Potentially a different column for the kicking stat, similar to a spoil. Because all these people are like, well, what happens if he kicks it to himself and he runs down and kicks a goal and you can't count it as a kick? Well, you can spoil a behind. So I think it's very unlikely that that would happen. But the best logical solution is to have a separate column, like a smother or a spoil or horny. Or a hit out. Or a hit out. Exactly right. Is it, is <laughs> it, all it is is one of these gurus at Champion to come up with another column and stop distorting the historical stats of the game. Horny, welcome to you on that note. G'day, Kane. G'day, G. Hello, Pleasure mate. to be here. Yeah, good. We're, um, yeah, we're starting to hit that mark of just getting that decent sample yep. size to yeah. actually yeah. start when we, working When are we with? there, Horny? I reckon we're probably another two weeks away yet okay. um, from actually getting that. Once we get there, we'll bring in the streamers and the balloons yep. and we'll have a bit of a celebration that we can actually get real with um, you know, a bit of confidence with what we're actually seeing. Does that but, mean we um, can't write anyone off? Like someone asked me, oh, well, Adelaide made the eight. And I said, well, you couldn't possibly make a case for them right now. But is, that, is it too early to write them off? I think it's too early, too early to write them off in terms of making the finals or not. Um, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's too early to actually start, you know, having those big conversations around whether or not they're going to be a threat this year um, or not. And As then, in a know, flag threat. Well, we're not measuring, you know, at, at round three, round four, whether or not you're going to win, you know, a, you know, a final week one. We're talking about what you're actually going to do prelim, final, grand final day potentially. So. Yeah. I think I think history is always the best guide, and until history changes, then you know the facts will will remain that way. There's been numerous examples over the last couple of years where people have been reluctant to sort of jump to conclusions because it is too early. Mm. But then, as the course of the season goes on, you know those discussions that were had at round two, round three actually end up proven to be correct. So, so of the undefeated sides. Is the evidence suggesting that, say, Fremantle could surprise and finish top four and have a crack at it, or are we more still interested in the eight? No, I'm more interested in the eight at the yeah. moment. They're going well. They're going well, Freo, but, um, yeah, they've still got a little bit of work to do in terms of, you know, until we start really looking at their profile and, and being wowed um, by, you know, potentially being a top four. Brisbane, side undefeated, uh, sorry, without a win? I'll get into Brisbane shortly. Okay, good. I'll get into Brisbane shortly on them. But, um, yeah, and, and I'll get into Adelaide as well, um, you know, as we go on. All right, looking well, I've jumped the gun it. again. Oh, what's your right. what's your overall um, observation? Was was that it, or you want to launch straight into your seven main talking points? No, we'll go the observation. So you know, always, you know, always sit down on a Sunday morning and have, have a coffee and sit and uh, and tune into Channel Nine, and uh, and my wife, my two girls are there on a Sunday morning as well, and then. Uh, and then we wait for the volcano to erupt, yeah. and, the, uh, and he and he uh, and he launches um, around the kick in, <laughs> around the kick in stat. And, and this time you got lava sprayed all bit. over yourself. And I just I just start giggling away because as Kane said, we had this conversation before. And my wife, who's not really that interested in footy, tunes in and she hears and she hears the words champion, champion Dara. Dara. <laughs> and her and her ears prick up. She goes, "Are you going to you going to fight back to this? I might I might bring this to the table on yeah. Tuesday. Well, we'll have a bit of a conversation around it." I hope it didn't it. come across as a, a criticism because I, I don't think you've really had an option or had time to sort of give it much thought because when you chipped it to yourself it was it was reasonably common that players would do it but nowhere near as common as what it is now to the point where you know I just get a bit frustrated that you know we're looking at stats and judging players in round 18 and it's the difference of a hundred kicks a year for someone like Nick Martin like that mm. and you're sitting down at the All-Australian meetings and I don't know it's not just judged on stats but you go and kick well he's had 70 more kicks as a defender than someone else who doesn't take the kick out. So you've got to factor that in. I just think it is a cheap stat that no one else has afforded. And when you have a record-breaking stats day in the history of the famous Essendon Football Club that shouldn't count, I thought it was worthy of bringing up. And I'm not sure whether you've thought of it, Horny, whether the champion think it's an issue or whether I'm overreacting, but it's probably somewhere in the middle. No, we, yeah, no, to be honest, yeah, we, we had lengthy conversations around it five years ago when it, you know, when it came into play around what do we do here? Do we actually, you know, warrant this with a disposal or not? Um, we had estimations around, you know, how, how much, you know, is this actually going to increase the disposals of the, um, you know, of the kick out player, if you like. But then at the end of the day, we had to, you know, we, we are sort of, you know, we you know, have to be guided, um, you know, 
if you you know if you like based on what the AFL do yep. around their rules a lot of the time so you know and you know going back over 150 years it's always been once you actually kick into yourself and play on from the goal square mm. that disposal gets warranted and this and this had to be in play so you know back to your point sort of Kane as well if you, if you look at pre this rule coming in it was you know it was about 25 percent of kick-ins were that little toe tap to yourself yep. and play on this year it's close to 90 percent mm. so 90 percent of the time it, it it happens. So, you know, the reality is it's actually a bit of a surprise when you actually don't actually see it happen, um, if you like. But it, it sort of just gets back to what we've, you know, been, um, you know, sort of speaking about on this show for the last 18 months. And it's sort of what, you know, you know, what are you actually measuring or what are you actually valuing, if you like? And the only thing that it's sort of, you know, I'm trying to assess is just the absolute impact that you have on matches. Not not, not you know, numerical, not the absolute pure disposals. And no. I've said this to you for eighteen months. I, yeah. I, I, you know, majority of time, I actually couldn't tell you who was a leading goal kicker on the ground or who was a leading disposal winner yep. on the ground. And I found it fascinating, and I was going to find it fascinating the commentary post the Essendon St Kilda game around Nick Martin because you're sitting there and every and it's and it's easy, and I get it. Everyone's got the basic stats in front of them and they can see Nick Martin's racking it up, racking it up. What's Ross going to do? What's Ross going to do? But at not one stage, you know, was I sitting there going, geez, he's, he's killing this game here. He, he's absolutely destroying this mm. for St Kilda. And he's had 44 disposals, but he was a 16th rated player on the ground. And I tune into post game to hear Ross and Ross is in his, in his roundabout way is sort of saying, I mm. didn't think he was having the impact mm. on the game. Whereas Andy McGrath was causing us more of a concern in the, in, in the coach's box. Mm. And we had him as the second highest rated player in the career. Yeah. So he got pure impact. Four, four coaches votes he got. Now we don't know how many, I don't know if you've worked, if anyone's out there has worked out the split. Sometimes those uh, geniuses that got more time than me do it and work out, okay, well he must've given him this and this. So Looks like he's got a three and a one. Okay. So you think Ross gave him one? I would have thought yeah, from I'd judging so, by yeah. his comments post game. So yeah, so then yeah, so either that or he got four, uh, and none, and none, and Sebastian Ross got a three and a one. And I and I've lauded Nick Martin, you know, all of last year. I thought he could have been in all Australian conversation for the wing roll. So this isn't Potton Nick Martin. Yeah. You know, that was his that was his seventeenth highest rated game across his forty seven game career. So he's had far greater impact on matches than what he did on the weekend in that same game. I'm looking at Riley Bonner, and I was interested in the commentary around this. 32 disposals, 1,000 metres gained. How 17 good, turnovers. How, how good was Riley Bonner? He, you know, he, but he was the 10th lowest rated player on the ground. The mm. impact that he had on the match wasn't there. So for forever and a day, we've been able to just purely look at disposals and then go, okay, that's how we're assessing performance. The game's gone past that. It's mm. all about damage. It's all about impact mm. in hand. So, you know, there are going to be records that are going to be broken over the next, you know, over the next coming years, just like there are games records that have been broken and, 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 and all different records that are going to happen. I, I, I honestly really couldn't care less about the disposal record anymore. Well, if you look at the disposal it's, number, it's gone up in 20 years. It's gone up from 250 average to 450 average. Yeah, so there's a so midfielder in your day that's, yep. what, 20 to 22 disposals a game is equivalent to, what, mm. you now 28 to 30 I still, disposals a game. I still think it was a big uh, – like, I disagree a bit because the, the history of the game is important. Like, I still think it was a big day when Pendlebury broke the all-time disposal record. Like, there, was a lot, there was a lot made of that, and I thought it was a special day. It's, it's like – LeBron James breaking the, the points record in the NBA. Of, of course, there's more points scored now because the prevalence of the three-point shot, like there's just, it's just the, the numbers of it, but it was still a huge thing for LeBron James to do that. And I'm not saying disposals are equal to points in basketball, but you know, I, I, I still think for those that like the history of the game... Frio just completely controlled that Ford 50 once the ball hit the deck, which is a bit of a surprise, as you said, just given... Given the personnel um, in, inside that area, there's but a I bloke just... who's played three games or sec- two games, and he had more he had more uh, time with the ball than Lockie Neal gets. Who's who's that? It was uh, the Michael Johnson lookalike. Oh, yeah, he was actually okay. He was good. Yeah, he was actually okay. Um, yeah. So then, if you just have a look at what they're doing offensively, and I and I'll be interested to see what the two of you think in terms of a magnet move, and it's Jordan Dawson back for flank me, for to mine. move into half back flank. Yep. So currently at the moment on our on our hundred X rating, he's actually rated as the three hundred and ninth best player in the competition. Yeah. He's having no impact. Yeah. And he's having no impact because this is the biggest surprise to me of the week. This is probably gold, if you like. 
He's rated as the worst kick in the competition really? this year. He's kicking 17% below AFL expectation this year, which makes him the worst kick in the competition. So it's not working as a midfielder. He has, he has not spent one minute um, you know, behind the ball this year. Kane, you're going and, to the Channel 9 big uh, soiree mm, tonight, I take it. That's that's a bit of gold you can spread. It is a, bit, it is a bit of gold. I mean, he, he, and he played a bit of a pseudo sort of run with role with Dangerfield. He had yeah. enough of the footy and his numbers looked okay, but I thought Dangerfield was the far superior player on the night. Is he, are they asking him to be too many things and does he need I, to narrow the focus? I reckon they are because, you know, and I've spoken on this show for the last couple of weeks that, you know, you think about the modern game is your ability to win it across that half-back line, explode, counter-attack, be aggressive and then score off the back of it. We're seeing that with GWS, Port Adelaide are doing it now, St Kilda, Sydney, Geelong are doing it off the back of what Collingwood and Geelong and Melbourne and Richmond and these teams have done for a number of years. Adelaide, Adelaide's clearance game in terms of just raw clearance wins is the fourth best in the competition. Their contest outside of clearance is the fifth best in the competition. How they defend ball movement is the fourth best in the competition. So there are aspects of their game that are okay. Mm. That part of the game, when they when they start with possession across that half-back line, they've done that 135 times for the year. They've started with possession across the half-back line. They've kicked two goals. Mm. Two goals. Yep. I, I, Amazing, yeah, um, uh, and and I'm not sure what you think, Kane, but I just and I don't want to be disrespectful to the individuals here, but to me, there's no one behind the footy that's a threat. No one. I was just about to ask exactly but, the same thing. So you're looking at Keane and Worrell and Mike Lane is a good young player, good defender, good in the set mark, but not a great ball user. Brody Smith down on form significantly mm. to the player that he was. Bit a bit of locky shoal. Um, you know, there's not anyone that is no weapons Sinclair or. Wanganine Miller or Whitfield. So maybe it maybe it is Dawson and I don't know, you bring a, a berry back in, but then that does disrupt your, your midfield. It makes it a bit same. You've got to have a Rankin or a Rochelle. Mm. I like Saligo in the midfield just to give it a point of difference. But yeah, Dawson's a good end set mark. He's a good ball user and maybe they need his leadership um, with the no name back line that they've got at the moment. Yeah, because I mean, it's clearly not working as a midfielder at yep. the moment. You've got to try and do something just to just energise mm. this ball movement game. Because I, I think you know Matt Crouch is actually having impact on matches at the moment in terms of what he's doing. So he's going well. Get someone else in there like a Saliga or a little bit more minutes into into Rankin or Rochelle or just something. Or even you know, Mick Henry, just something. Just a little yeah. bit of buzz. You, you could look at Laird there. as well. I mean, Laird, Laird is an All-Australian halfback and it was pretty effective. He doesn't have the height or probably the intercepting ability that Dawson has, but not sure he's having the same impact as a as a midfielder and, and Crouch has sort of can fill that void. So maybe Laird, maybe uh, the other one that could go back there as well. But big question marks to Matty Nix. I haven't really loved what he said this week. Basically, that they're in a hole, a dark hole. That's a... Uh, that's not a great place to be Hard after to round three. Of. Yeah, round, mm. round three. So a big game for them and a great test and their draw is really problematic for them. Tell me about some unsung blues. Yeah, so I just want to give it, yeah, um, a bit of love just to four players here for Carlton, if you like. And these, and I heard Kingy mention it, um, you know, post you know post the coverage on, um, on Friday as well, that, you know, once you actually get buy-in in terms of what's happening, you know, without the footy, that's when you can actually elevate yourself to the next level as a team, but there are some individuals that just play an important role to what we're so you know what we're seeing so far with Carlton. And I just want to look at the forward half of the ground to start with. So Lockie Fogarty and Matt Cottrell. I love what Matt Cottrell said. It might have been a week ago or two weeks ago on radio. People don't come to the footy to watch me. Right, <laughs> they don't because all I I run up and yeah. back. I play half or I help us. I help us defend transition and I help us get out of transition. Yep. But I'm not. I'm not there to be the match winner. I'm the role player. And Lockie Fogarty, exactly the same. So the one area that we were looking at with Carlton this year is: Are they going to improve their transition game? Because if they don't, they're not going to be competing come preliminary final weekend. So far, small sample, only three games in, significant improvement. Mm. And if it continues down this path, they're probably going to be the main challenger to um, to GWS as the as the year goes on. The other one I just want to talk about is offensively what's actually happening to their. Um, you know, sort of to their transition game. And that's Jordan Boyd. So we just talked about how, how poor Jordan Dawson's ball use is, yep. the worst in the competition. Jordan Boyd is the seventh best kick in the competition. Really? So now behind, so I, so just when you're watching this guy, you might be a little bit surprised by him, but he, but he takes on kicks. He's challenging, you know, in terms of, you know, wanting to change angles and be aggressive with ball in hand. And more often than not, he actually pulls off those types of kicks. So he's been a huge addition. 
And then you add in the role that George Hewitt plays. And I think, I think he's probably the perfect example of what, you know, you're looking for to nullify the opposition's main midfielder yep. whilst being able to offer, um, you know, offensively as well. And his performance against, against LDU, who I consider a star of the, of the competition, to be the fifth highest rated player on the ground for mm. Hewitt and to, and to have LDU as the 28th highest rated player on the ground is a significant tick. And his role on, um, on Lockie Neal in round zero to, you know, it's, to sort of keep him under yep. wraps, if you like, was a huge reason as to why they were able to get over the line in the second half as well. So there's just a couple of players. We know that they have their stars. They have, you know, McKerno and Kai ahead of the ball. They have Weedering behind there. They've got, the, you know, they've got a, a, um, a, a, you know, a real dynamic midfield. But to actually have these role players in place as well, just I think that could be the reason as to why they elevate their game. Right, Do you think play. it's uh, growing in popularity, Kane? Because... Canelio's doing a similar role. He's mm. getting plenty of it himself, but he is it's the watcher. He is lining up and putting a little bit of ice on yeah. anybody who uh, is the number one. Definitely, guy. his form over the last twelve months has been terrific, and a lot of those veterans at the Giants are the reason that they're in the position that they're in. Hoiny, we play guess who? What's the clue? So three rounds in, this player is a seventh highest rated player in the comp. He plays for a bottom three team in the competition seventh at the moment. Highest rated player in the comp. He plays for a bottom three team. The seventh highest rated player in the AFL who plays for a bottom three team. Jared, did you have any ideas? I'm going with, uh, I don't think it can be anybody from Hawthorne. It could be a couple of North Melbourne mids, but I'm going for McGovern as one of my favourites. Good bad, guess. Good bad guess, but guess. no. Why incorrect. Sorry, G. Okay. I love, I love this text that's just come through. Sheasel, thanks to the kick-ins, eh, Kano? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to say Kevin. James Warple. James Warple. Uh, I'll get to Warple later on. Uh, it is not Warple. Oh, not who is Warple. it? I'll get. It is Tom Powell from okay. North really? Melbourne. So, I just uh, one of Luffy's boys. Yeah, and I keep talking about um, yeah, and yeah, players that really impact you with ball in hand yeah. are the hardest ones to assess. You know, their damage alive, if you like. I think you know, um, you know, the absolute ball winners, you know, that win contest and win clearance, yeah, you know, they're sort of more eye catching live, if you like, and you know, and, and they probably get the recognition. The ball users are, are really hard to appreciate. That's him. Yep. So out of all the midfielders in the competition so far this year, he's having the third most impact with ball in hand. So he's got this beautiful balance at the moment in terms of ten contested possessions a game and eighteen uncontested a game. So you know, automatically, if you're looking at that on the stat sheet, it's probably not going to be sexy and it's not going to be appealing to really, you know, you know, sort of appreciate the impact that he's actually actually having. But I think if, you, if you're watching this guy now moving forward, just appreciate what he's actually doing with ball in hand. His ball winning ability for a midfielder is actually still top 25 as well. So he mm. has that real nice balance now that he's actually getting permanent midfield time. So just want to just give Tom Powell a little bit of love. Okay, love given very quickly. A couple of texts. Did you long bouncing in 2024 then? Yeah, so they yeah, so they might. So everything everything that could go wrong in twenty twenty three did go wrong for Geelong last yep. year. And you can and you can just, you know, almost just pretty much just put a line through through what absolutely happened in twenty twenty three, which is why, you know, I was you know reasonably bullish on their chances to, you know, to finish top six. How yep. far they can actually go, time will tell. Um, you know, but they have actually actually started well, you know, as I said last year, just put a line through it with everything that could go wrong, did go wrong. And the difference is Brisbane have been contender for five years. The others were just starting their window, Hoiny. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually incorrect, um, if you like. You know, so the teams that I mentioned, you know, Collingwood had been contending for a flag for three to four years, um, if you like. You know, Hawthorne, Hawthorne had been contending and, and had won a flag as well, um, you know, o- over a three to four year period. Melbourne had made a prelim final. Geelong had made a prelim and a semi final, um, and and Richmond had made three. Yep. Um, Three straight final series in a row. So, um, yeah, so now those teams had had final success um, or finals appearances before actually having that crack after a down year. Okay, but, we're moving on to uh, other issues that took your eye. Yeah, so Paul Adelaide, just want to put this on watch. So, love what they're doing offensively. I think that they're, um, you know, really, really dynamic and powerful in terms yep. of what they're absolutely doing offensively. No one is turning possession into a score more often than what, than what Port Adelaide are doing. This is with um, that Corn uh, Francis, too. Yeah, at the moment. So, and their Ford 50 is, is actually functioning the best in the competition um, at the moment. Accuracy did, um, you yeah. know, sort of really impact their game. 
um, on the weekend, which was um, you know sort of a bit of irony, if you like, for Melbourne, given that that's been an issue for them more often than not o- over time. But I'm just putting this on watch at round three. I'm putting this defensive 50 group on watch mm-hmm. at the moment. And in terms of what they're doing when the ball's in an air and in a one-on-one contest, brilliant. They've been involved in 21 one-on-one contests as a team so far for Adelaide this year. Yet to lose one. Wow! It's one of the best streaks that we've seen since actually having this number, which is about a fifteen, a fifteen-year period now. So well done. Once the ball's on the deck, huge issues, massive issues in terms of what Port Adelaide are able to do. No one is worse on the deck inside their own defensive fifty than what Port Adelaide have been, um, you know, sort of so far this year. Sorry, sorry, seventeenth in in that area, um, if you like. Only North Melbourne are actually more vulnerable inside their own defensive fifty. So I just want to just put that on watch because they have played West Coast, they have played Richmond, and then they had that you know really good contest against Melbourne. So yep. they have played two of the lower ranked teams so far this year. And it has still been an issue. It's still been an issue in terms of how often this this defensive six and defensive seven is giving up a score once the opposition go inside 50. You know, that's ranked um, as the fourth easiest defensive 50 to score against at the moment once you actually do go inside 50 despite, you know, sort of playing that that opposition. Helps when you this, take the ball in the on the right side of the line and the wrong side yeah, of the line. Oh, what about that, eh? That was, oh, that was amazing watching, so we're talking, watching that. We're talking everyone that's involved here. We're talking small yeah. defenders. We're talking wingers in particular. And we're talking the midfielders not getting back hard enough. Spot on. So they, it, it's so aggressive in terms of what they do offensively, which is great, and that's why it's great to watch. Their halfback flankers, Burton and Houston, are, are, are really powerful in terms of Farrell, what they do, ball yeah. in hand. Farrell, exactly the same. But going back the other way and having to get your hands dirty inside your own D50, that's on watch because, as I said, we're only three games in, but if that continues over the next six, seven, eight weeks and then, you know, God forbid, a whole, a whole season – that is going to be extremely challenging to hold up when we're actually talking about come preliminary final, mm. grand final weekend. It was a huge issue for them last year. People didn't want to believe it when they went on that 11 or 12 game period. It eventually came true as the year, as the year went on. Um, and it's, and it's already started that way, you know, albeit only three games into their, um, to their campaign. Mm, all right, let's move on to the team that is placed last. Uh, unsurprisingly, it's the Eagles. What have you observed, Horny? Yeah, so I just want to, you know, probably a little bit different, um, you know, if you'd like to, a lot in the industry. And, you know, they've played Paul Adelaide over, over in Adelaide. They've played GWS of the flag favourite, and then they've played the Dogs at Marvel. Yep. I, 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 I don't know what anyone else was expecting out of those performances other than, you know, if, if they got within five goals, you know, you'd be pretty surprised. So the general view from what like, I've read is they're getting worse. Yeah, I, I, I don't see that. So, like, last year... Last year they finished the year fifty to fifty one percent. So that's that's putting you, you know, in the category of, you know, the worst seasons that we've seen for ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty yep. years, right? That's putting you in, in, in um, you know, the Gold Coast GWS days, Melbourne at their worst, Fitzroy at their worst. It you know, it was a it was a horrible season. Their profile was red everywhere you looked. There wasn't one aspect of their game where they could finish the year yep. and go, We got that right. So you have to start somewhere. In this rebuild, you have to start somewhere. And I think what Adam Simpson and West Coast are doing is, okay, well, where we're going to start is at clearance. We understand the base that we're coming from. It is miles back. We are, we are you know, yeah. a, a long way back, but we're going to start here. So, so far this year, they're the ninth best clearance team in the competition. Big and their ground ball work is the fifth best in the competition. Mm. They haven't got the Ford 50 to be able to, you know, cash in on that. And I heard someone talk about, you know, post-game that, oh, you know, stats are misleading because, you know, the Bulldogs had 51 entries and West Coast had 51 entries and West Coast win clearances, but they lose. There's, there's just so much more into the game yeah. than that, than just looking at those, at those numbers. But what they're doing in, in that space at the moment is a tick. And if that continues on for the year, at least they get to the end of the season and you go, well, we have improved in one area of the game. Mm. Unrealistic to sit back after the year that they had in 23 and the year that they had in 22 and think, well, you know, we're going to fix this and we're going to fix this and we're going to be top 10 this. And Particularly we're with the ruckman and the key forward, yeah. You're not going to have that. So I just want to just put that on the agenda that that's, I think that's where they're putting their energy into. So they've so had a good start to the season good in, in some respects. Everything else in their game at the moment is, is, is horrible. Yeah. Right? But, but I think, I think that was the expectation, but to actually see a little bit of improvement in this area of the game, 
tick to them. And the final tick I just want to give to is just a little bit of love to Jeremy McGovern. Mm. I think if, if McGovern hadn't been playing the last couple of weeks, they might have lost games by 80, 90 to mm. 100 points. So, so far this year, he's the number one rated key defender um, in the competition, number 20 across the entire competition. So he started well, but I just think that talk around that they're getting worse, I think that's um, yeah incorrect. Doesn't get much easier for them. Sydney gather round off a loss is going to be tough, but maybe Richmond at home with all of their injuries and out presents a, a good opportunity for the Eagles to get their first win of the season. Right, tell me about Nick Loston. Well, I just want to have this conversation with the two of you and just and, and you know, sort of watching his performance on Sunday against Sydney, I thought he was unbelievable. Just got me thinking that, you know, you know I don't think this guy's made all Australian um, you know, across his career, but the impact that he's had on the competition and the impact that he's had on Richmond over the last, you know, seven or eight years... I think, and this might sound a bit of a ridiculous call, is up there with what Tom Stewart has done with Geelong. And Tom Stewart is an absolute superstar of the competition. He's been four or five times. Five-time All-Australian, yeah. been absolutely phenomenal. But in terms of what Vlosten has done, over the last seven years, off, off our 100X rating, he's the 25th best player in the competition over the last seven years. Yep. To put that into context, Tom Stewart's around about 50 to 55 mm. in the competition. In this, in this period, and we've talked about the intercept game and that being king, if you haven't got it, you can't compete. Over a seven-year period, he's won the fourth most intercepts of any player in the competition. He's won the fourth most intercept marks of any player in the competition, which is, which is unbelievable given the size of the bloke. And then in terms of what's been able to actually get on the scoreboard for his intercepts, he's generated the second most points of any player in the competition off his intercept work over a seven-year period. So I, I just wanted us to, you know, just. So give you're him... challenging Kane to. Uh, no, no, no. I'm not challenging. Yeah, I'm open, not challenging him from an all, you know, from an all Australian conversation in 2023. I think that's sorry, pretty early. In, in, yeah, in 2024, we're far too early for that. But just more, just having the bigger picture conversation yeah. and the celebration of this guy. I'm not sure how many games he's played. He might have played 200 games by now. Yeah. I've got, I've got no idea. But just in terms of his career and what he's been able to do and the impact that he's had on the competition. I think that, you know, others like, you know, McGovern and, and, and Stewart and these guys and Moore now and Andrews and Lever and May and all these guys get the, you know, get the recognition that they deserve. I just think, I think that this guy probably needs to just have that recognition elevated um, a little bit more. All right. So he's played stuff. 215 games, of course, three-time premiership player, all Australian squad once in the COVID year of 2020 and he's... Highest place in the best and fairest is fourth a couple of times, 2019 and 2023. So not a whole lot of love from the best and fairest voters. Of course, though, in an era where they had a lot of good players, much yep. higher to win a best and fairest in a good team than a poor team. Of course, I like it. Nick Loston getting a lot of love uh, this week.